Excuse me, miss. I'm sorry. No, yet you're not. But you will be. Hey! What the hell? It was a comic book with a superhero. <laughs> Oh, not tonight. It's a political, moral action movie, basically, that has strong ideological overtones. There is something terribly wrong with this country. The only verdict is vengeance. A vendetta. The character of V, he's a pretty complex man. One side of him is this avenging angel. The other side of him is a very cultured, educated man. You're getting back. What they did to you. What was done to me was monstrous. And they created a monster. When we made The Matrix, we learned that people are not looking just for action. I mean, they want more. They want ideas. If our own government was responsible for the deaths of 100,000 people, would you really want to know? Larry and Andy and James, they're always doing interesting and dangerous work. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. Vendetta is based on a graphic novel that was created in the early 80s by Alan Moore and David Lloyd. It's like a 30s movie. I mean, it, and it was very modernist. It was a really beautiful piece of art. It was like this, you know, this old-fashioned comic in the future. The graphic novel itself was drawn in a very cinematic way, you know, and when, when it was done, it broke with convention. They were the first times that I was aware of the phrase graphic novel. It elevated the drawing style. It was much more painterly. It was much more artistic, much more interesting than they had been when I was reading my DC comics as a kid. I was really impressed by its literacy, uh, if I can put it that way, by the fact that, you know, the hero V quotes Shakespeare and Baker than Marlowe and, and, and has a marvelous, zestful uh, use of language. I think the bizarre quality of V, that sort of long hair and that funny mask and the hat, no, nobody ever seen a character looking like that. That was the strangest, weirdest character. V is the hero, but he's not always good. <laughs> he sometimes does things that you can't possibly like. You're going to kill me now. I killed you 10 minutes ago. He's an aberrant superhero, but he is a superhero. I mean, he has superpowers, practically. I mean, not, he can't fly, he's not impervious to bullets, but he has great skill with his knives, and he's great skill with deception. He, he understands how to get in and out of places with nobody really seeing or being aware of him. He's been imprisoned and tortured and abused mentally and physically, and then burnt in fire. All these changes that have affected him like any superhero character. He does have, you know, speed and agility, but it's almost like as an afterthought. I don't get it. Why does he wear a Guy Fawkes mask and then blow up the Bailey? Didn't Fawkes try to blow up Parliament? It's not too late. Maybe it's just getting started. V is a sort of reborn Guy Fawkes, a kind of convenient kind of metaphor for what we think of as a freedom fighter. <laughs> Guy Fawkes was uh, part of a band of conspirators who planned to blow up the Houses of Parliament in 1605. And the idea was to create a kind of disorder in the country from which a new regime might appear which would have less of a rigid attitude towards Catholicism. So Guy Fawkes was a kind of early anarchist. One of the relics of the gunpowder plot is a festival that we have every year on November the 5th, in which we burn an effigy of Guy Fawkes. People would put the guy on top of the bonfire and have a big fireworks night and then set fire to the bonfire and squeal and scream and watch Guy Fawkes burn and yet kind of revere him. I saw once in a pub in the north of Ireland um, a placard behind the bar which said, 
Guy Fawkes, the only man to enter the Houses of Parliament with honest intentions. And I thought it would be an interesting idea of the character, this saboteur wore Guy Fawkes mask. In the former United States, civil war continues to devastate. Three waters has, in fact, been contaminated. Inside the quarantine zone, a new airborne pathogen has killed 20... There's a wave of destruction throughout the underground. Bollocks. It is a, a future society and a totalitarian state where there is a, a very ordered government that controls all the freedoms of the people. Those caught in violation of curfew will be prosecuted without leniency or exception. Art literature is, is censored. Um, the news is very propagandist. It's sort of a cross between a, a fascist society and the extreme conservative politics that we see in many countries of the world today. Fueled by the media, fear and panic spread quickly, fracturing and dividing the country until at last the true goal comes into view. Fear. The world has suffered greatly. The Middle East has fallen apart. America is a leather colony. England has become an island unto itself. The Chancellor is completely single-minded and has no regard for the political process. The more power he attains, the more obvious his zealotry, and the more aggressive his supporters become. This is a society that uh, quite honestly believes the whole Hitlerian idea, that this is the best way to run a country. We're calling it an emergency demolition. We have spin coverage on the network and throughout the interlink. I want Provero to speak tonight on the dangers of these old buildings and how we must avoid clinging to the edifice of a decadent past. What we need is a clear message to the people of this country. I want everyone to remember why they need us. The government that's now in power rescued Britain from the worst ravages of it. But then a few years pass and the threat is gone, but this authoritarian government's still there. And it's a regime which is authoritarian, which uh, has a sort of oppressive stranglehold on the freedom of the individual. And then you have, like, the, the lead character who is very altruistic and thinks he can bring about great change, you know, within the government by making the people realise how the government has, you know, somehow got it out of control. On the other hand, he has this murderous vendetta about everyone who's ever done anything wrong to him. Good evening, Commander Prothero. It is you, the ghost of Christmas past. He's vengeful, and because of that, it, it sort of taints his political idealism. You're getting back at them for what they did to you. What was done to me was monstrous. And they created a monster. He is an uncompromising character. I mean, he wants to fulfill his agenda. The only verdict is vengeance, a vendetta. He is on his way to destroy the old Bailey, which is his first major act. On his way there, he sees a young girl being attacked by a secret police. Don't touch me. Oh, look, Willie Kitty, he's got claws. And he rescues her. He then has to take her down to his home. He's gone underground, sort of very, you know, Phantom of the Opera style. What is this place? It's my home. I call it the Shadow Gallery. It's beautiful. Where'd you get all this stuff? Oh, here and there, much of it from the vaults of the Ministry of Objectionable Materials. He's become a custodian of everything that the government won't allow, books and music and art. He doesn't want her to give away his hiding place, so he, he has to kind of keep her under lock and key. I have to stay here. Only until I'm done. After the fifth, I no longer think it'll matter. You mean a year from now? Sorry, Evie. V has been planning for this particular day, which is November the 5th. He wants to continue what Guy Fawkes and the plotters of November the 5th weren't able to do, blow up the Houses of Parliament, a symbol of tyranny. He is a freedom fighter, essentially. He's trying to break down a very totalitarian regime. The character of Evie, she goes from being this passive person to sort of, by chance, ending up with V, sort of not by her own doing and not being happy about it. Do you know why you're here, Evie Hammond? You're being formally charged with conspiracy to commit treason, terrorism and sedition, the penalty for which is death by firing squad. You have one chance and only one chance to save your life. You must tell us the identity or whereabouts of codename V. Do you understand what I'm telling you? 
Yes. Are you ready to cooperate? No. Through her imprisonment, she sort of learns how to face her fear and that overcoming that fear is the most important for, for her own integrity. <laughs> Those who are responsible will be held accountable. The time has come for you to live without fear. Violence can be used for good. What are you talking about? Justice. You might have set ideas about certain issues in your mind already, and this sort of, you know, attacks those. Who's that? Don't piss me about. If you show me an idea, or I'll get Storm Saxon on your ass. thing about the Wachowski brothers is that when they write a project, they don't clarify what the audience is seeing with a specific point of view. They leave the audience to determine how they want to interpret the material. So I think that it's a politically charged movie, but it's up to the audience to figure what that means. Good evening, London. There are, of course, those who do not want us to speak. Why? Words will always retain their power. For those who will listen, the enunciation of truth. And the truth is, there is something terribly wrong with this country. It's not saying this is right and this is wrong because, you know, the morality of it's very, you know, ambiguous at times, but it asks you questions that you can think about and take away, and it doesn't really give you easy answers. I ask you to stand beside me. One year from tonight, outside the gates of Parliament, and together we shall give them a 5th of November that shall never, ever be forgotten. The state should be there to serve the people rather than the other way around. And that's exactly what V's on about. So do you know what's going to happen? No. I can guess. This is another version it seems to me, and a timely one, of reminding people that it's wrong to push people into corners. Bloody Christ. The message is that it's in everybody's possession to be responsible for their own future, and you don't have to do anything that you don't actually really believe in. The Wachowski brothers wrote the first draft in the mid-90s, and um, before we made The Matrix. It followed very closely the comic book. They said to me, how do you feel about letting James McTee direct it? Now, James was our first AD on all The Matrix movies. I thought, what a great idea. So we immediately sat down and figured, how can we make this picture? I, I yelled now. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you take your hands down. When we were in post-production on the Matrix films, Larry and Andy gave me a present. They said, hey, have you, have you read have you read this, you know, V for Vendetta? Do you think it's worth making into a film? I said, yeah, I think it's worth making into a film. And they said, well, what do you think about us producing it and you directing it? And I said, well, what? that sounds like it could be good. I've known James for a long time, actually. It's been great to come here and work with him as a director. He's able to stay really relaxed and keep a good atmosphere on set, even when, like, you know, things get really intense, which is amazing. He also tries a lot of different things. Like, he always wants to try it, you know, in a bunch of different ways, which is fun to do as an actor. What do you think of that? It's been an absolute pleasure. He's highly intelligent, interesting, and um, a gentleman. So I've had a wonderful time with him. We really have a great, great cast. Natalie Portman is just glorious. I mean, she is just an unbelievable actress, so beautiful. I'm immensely impressed with she's 12 and a half years old or something. She's a barely divided embryo. She's immensely accomplished, immensely um, natural film actress. She's quite something. She went through such hell in the movie. I mean, she gets her head shaved. Those scenes where she's dealing with kind of squalor, she's shooting them in kind of squalor. I mean, and it, it was a rough performance. You faced your death, Evie. You were calm, you were still. But if you know what you felt then. <laughs> Natalie's been delightful. 
She's a highly intelligent, very easygoing uh, person. I enjoyed working with her a lot. You've got nothing, nothing but your bloody knives and your fancy karate gimmicks. We have guns. No, what do you have are bullets and the hope that when your guns are empty, I'm no longer standing, because if I am, he'll all be dead before you've reloaded. Yuta Weaving is a magnificent actor and, and just, you know, we know him very well. He's done three movies with us. He's the three Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, he's a great, accomplished performer. And then to play, you know, V. Hugo has a couple of things going for him. He has a theatre background, which was very, you know, important to the character. He has a great physicality as an actor, which was also important. And he has a great voice. And, you know, knowing him from the Matrix films, what a fantastic actor he was, what a great human being he was, and it just seemed like a, a good and easy choice. Stephen Ray is just fantastic. And Stephen Fry, who is just so funny and such a great guy, and, and, and John Hurt, who is just... I can't see anybody else playing that part. Our enemy is an insidious one, seeking to destroy the very foundation of our great nation. It was obvious from the very outset, you know, with the script and the way it was and how many sets there were that it was gonna be important to have someone who could give you great design and build great sets in a very short amount of time. The film got going really quickly. Owen did like an amazing job, as he did like on the Matrix films. There's about 89 set areas that we have, or location areas that we have in the film. Some of them like, have four or five parts. All the interiors for the film are being shot here in um, Babelsberg Studios in Berlin. And the challenge for us really is to build, um, you know, English, uh, London sort of interiors and, and we've shot a little on location in Germany finding German locations, Berlin locations that convincingly match for London. Well it's been really great to be in Berlin. Um, the studio is amazing and it's heavy with history here so it gives so much sort of weight to, to what we're doing. We have tried to take a more a measure of London when people look at it and say, wow, I can, I can see this London, I can recognise it. I think James wanted a sense of earthiness that London has, a grittiness, a sense of London that is very recognisable, as, as London is today, or as it would have been even 20 years ago, it, but also a London that you feel a lot would be around in another 20 years' time, particularly in a world that's been kind of frozen by England becoming a totalitarian state. It's as though um, sort of creativity is almost stopped in a way. Um, so a lot of the interiors, a lot of the dressing is very much today or even slightly retro in a way. James McTeague always sort of pulled back from doing a sort of futuristic look. We used a lot of greys and grey tones and all the furniture kind of blended in into one sort of particular tone and it just made it slightly more regimented. And then adding our sort of our big brother look. A yellow coated curfew is now with some telegraph poles with speakers on and cameras everywhere and that sort of thing. We paid particular attention to the ageing and the kind of the grain and the visceral texture of the, the film. Every set has been in its own little complex way, but obviously the biggest one has got to be the shadow gallery where V lives. I remember sitting down and saying to Owen, you know, like, a, It'd be great, you know, if in some ways this was like an, an expanded ace of clubs, if you like, and, you know, there'd always be like a central piece and then there'd be V's dressing room or V's kitchen or TV lounge, and if it could all sort of spiral out from the middle. It's a cross between a crypt and an undercroft. You could almost imagine 30 years ago they bricked up a door and they forgot it was there. Is this another trick, V? No. No more tricks. No more lies. Only truth. We've all seen projects where there have been people cloaked in some way. I, I was saying to Larry one day, I'm so worried about this mask. And he would say to me, Joel, trust the mask. Just trust it. 
His mask is a cross between how Guy Fawkes was and a Harlequin mask. It's part of his, you know, actorly vaudevillian behaviour to wear this mask, you know, which hides how horribly disfigured he is underneath. There is a face beneath this mask, but it's not me. I thought if the mask was good enough and you thought about how the voice would come out, how you lit the mask, that you would be able to humanise the mask. You could almost look through the mask and see the person in there. For me, it's been a matter of trying to animate the mask, make the mask work, make the character work through the mask. And, and so it's it's a matter of working with James and working with the DP and trying to get, trying to make the mask work. The way James shot it, it's so effective because the lighting is always changing and the mask looks different. Is he smiling there? Is he mad? Please have mercy. Oh, not tonight, Bishop. Hugo is such a great performer that you have such a sense of the character of V that the mask doesn't get in the way of that. And and he he uses the mask so that, that it works for him and it works for the audience. I wish I wasn't afraid all the time, but I am. It's a very entertaining movie. It has great performances. It's exciting. It's thrilling. And I think people, when they see it, will really be affected by it. These tracks lead to Parliament. Yes. The thing I liked about this film is that, you know, it dared to ask the questions, you know. The security of this nation depends on complete and total compliance. Anarchy, chaos of anarchy. I think it's going to be a serious problem in this century. But I don't think that violence is the answer to anything. I can't feel anything anymore. Don't run from it, Ethan. You've been running all your life. It reflects a lot of the sort of politicking that's that's happening in our world today, and that you should be afraid of everything. If our own government was responsible for the deaths of almost 100,000 people, would you really want to know? I don't believe this is really about the future. It's, it's about now. It's about every time. Several prominent party members have been murdered, Chief Inspector. From one person's point of view, yes, V is a terrorist, and yet from other people's point of view, he's actually the freedom fighter. This is exactly what he wants. What? Chaos. Kill him. The time has come for you to live without fear. I'm ready. Everything was connected. We're all part of it. Are we ready for it?